and uh, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been a good time. And so today, as we, we get towards the end of the series and, and whatnot, um, you know, when you, when you watch the show, see, they, they go through this thing where they, they take the metal, they make the metal into something, right? And then at the end of it, you have people who bash these, these beautiful wonderful knives and stuff into things that they should just never do and then they try to test them and do all those things and and whatnot and so as I we're getting to the end of this series I've been God has just reminded me of how ready we are whenever we are forged into his likeness amen for anything that comes our way so this morning I can do nothing else other than to uh, start this trial series off by um, taking this wonderful, beautiful knife that I have, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go over here. We're gonna get this stuff set up while we go. Um, just gonna throw that there. And look, I even brought a shield for you guys. I so I've been working on making a knife uh, because that was my goal. I don't even, oh, um, I need strong people. Just kidding. It's not that heavy. But I've been working on making this wonderful knife, and I finally put this up here. Because I don't want anyone, well, it's in pieces, so never mind. You guys, we're just going to deal with it. Um, All right? So, um, plan B. Uh, Everybody, I have a waiver in the back that I would like for you all to sign. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, no, so I've been making this beautiful knife, and it's not very beautiful. It actually, (laughs) I noticed today, it looked like an old Indian knife. Um, But I took a, a railroad tie. And I forged it into a knife, which is uh, pretty awesome, I got to admit, all right? Um, It took a long time, I mean hours. So because I started off, y'all know from my previous sermon, I started off with just one torch trying to to move this piece of metal and make it into something, and uh, I didn't have enough heat, so I made a little forge at the house out of some fire bricks and two torches, and finally was able to heat it up, but it it wasn't getting quite that hot. Um, So I'll tell you what, I don't know how you can watch this show and not think that these guys have the largest forearms in America, because when you take a hammer and you swing it that many times at a knife, your arm goes numb, all right? And I want y'all to know... (laughs) I was sore for days. I had blisters. I had all sorts of things going on. Now, it didn't help that I didn't have any of the right equipment, and I was doing this in my backyard while my dog washed me, wondering, what the, like, what is going on, man? He's like, what, you mad at something? Just beating the fire out of this metal. And so, um, so that happened. So I made this knife, and now I'll be honest with you guys. They go through this test, and first they start with a strength test to see if it can withstand what's going on. And then they go to a sharpness test to see if it's still sharp. And I'll be honest, I didn't make it that sharp because I was fully planning on smashing this thing into something this morning. And I was like, well, if that breaks... And it's real sharp. I'm in trouble. So I had to think about my own safety. I know that doesn't happen often. Um, but I don't have any protection this morning, so I don't really feel like smashing this into something and it potentially breaking and flying into one of you guys. Seems like the safest idea. So, Sister Cindy, I need you to sit. No, I'm just playing. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, so, so we're just going to skip that because I don't really want anyone to die. Um, but... When you go into the Forge and Fire series, they take these knives and they make them out of nothing. And I actually brought a deer antler this morning that uh, was forever ago. And what they do is they take them and they take these knives and they smash them into things like deer antlers and things like that. And then after they do that, they examine the knife and they look for chips. They look for cracks or they look for the dreaded other end of your knife when it flies off. Um, If I was doing this test this morning that's what I would be looking for is the other end of the knife because I have full confidence that I could cut something with it, but I don't have full confidence in the fact that I actually made this knife correctly on the inside, all right? It's in the right shape, but I don't know about anything else on it. Um, So, yeah, because I made a smaller knife out of the door hinge thing, and I I realized it worked good for a while, and then I was skinning a deer one day, and the whole thing just went whoop. And I was like, well, something wasn't right in there. Knives don't usually do that. So, um, yeah, my confidence in my knife-making skills went pew. Um, Sound effects and all at the same time. 
Um, but then they, after they do that, they go through and they look at it and they say, okay, either it's really good or it's really bad, right? And what's amazing is sometimes these guys go on these shows and they'll smash them into oil drums, they'll smash them into deer antlers, they'll smash them into ice and into concrete. And I'm like, first off, if I ever, ever smash my knife into concrete, I'd probably cry because I'd be like, well, that's, that's toast, right? Uh, men, if you've ever been using a knife and you were trying to cut something and all of a sudden you just went sliding across a piece of metal or something, you think... Well, that's probably dull now, right? And I'm like, man. But they do this, and some of these knives come through, and they come on unscathed. And I'm like, first off, that's amazing. But then after they do all that, they go through a sharpness test, and they try to cut things and whatnot. And so uh, the winner is the one who takes the least damage and still has the sharpest knife, right? Uh, or the sword or whatever they make. And so as we come to this end of the series, um, God was just placing in my heart that when the trial comes is, the, is the, the message today, right? Because I want us to understand something that the trials of life, the trials of things that we go through, right, uh, are part of, of what defines our, our testimony, what defines the things that, that we are to witness to people and things like that. And so when we were talking about the things, the trials that come, I was thinking about these knives that we were making, and I was thinking about all this stuff that was going on, and I was thinking about how God uses us and how God makes us, and he forges us into our full potential, right? So God forges us and makes us into something that can be used. Now, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about like these things that we were talking about, right? Because dad used those in his uh, uh, initial series uh, illustration thingamabob, um, whatever I'm trying to say. And whenever he used those, I thought about those, right? And I thought about the fact that these things have never been used, right? I'm going to let you know right now that if I go into Walmart and someone tries to get in a fight with me and they pull those out, I'm not only going to be shocked, but I'm going to be terrified because I don't even know how to defend from one of those things, okay? Uh, I'm just kidding. I got an idea. But uh, we'll leave that. That's, that's not a Forge and Fire series right there. Uh, but <laughs> they got these things here, right? They've never been used. And honestly... You would never think to bring those into a fight. If I had to choose between a sword and those two things, I'm going to choose the sharp pointy thing, amen? Listen, if I take your leg off with my sword, those things ain't going to be too good, right? Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, but for real, I was thinking about these things, and they don't really, they've never been used, they never been, and I was thinking about God is not into aesthetics, right? It doesn't matter how pretty the knife looks. Like, this knife is not pretty, but if I sharpened it up, it would be a very useful tool, right? God uh, puts us into a place where we may not feel like we are aesthetically pleasing, but God allows us to be used, amen? Just like when Jesus, he could have came down and God could have cleared out every hotel room, every motel room, every house in the place, and, and made it uh, easily accessible for Jesus to be born in a nice place with all the nicest stuff. But what happened is, is Jesus was born where? In a manger, amen? In a stinky, stinky manger full of animals because that's where they lived. And I want you to understand something. Those places stink sometimes, amen? If you've ever met my dog and he's been outside running around and doing all sorts of stuff, he stinks after just a little while. Think about animals living in a barn. If you've ever been to a pig farm where we used to, uh, my grandfather used to have a pig farm. We go there and my parents used to work on one. I want you to understand something. It tastes delicious, but it doesn't smell good when it's growing. Amen? Um, <laughs> God's not about aesthetically pleasing things. Amen? He's about making us useful and making us into a place where we can reach our full potential. Amen? So this morning, as we talk about the trials, I want to talk about three things that, that were coming to my mind uh, when it comes to trials in our life. And just like these knives and, and every trial and things that we were going to put them through and stuff like that, when we think about these things, I want to think about these trials. And the first thing that came to my mind is no matter what, no matter where we go, first and foremost, trials and problems are coming. Amen? I don't care what you do and where you go. If you think for one second in your life that you're never going to face adversity, a problem, or a trial again in your life, I am here to tell you without a shadow of a doubt, you are wrong. Amen. I don't say that many times in church just to, to throw that out there, but I want you to understand something. 
things are going to come up in your life that do not feel like they should be going the way that they are going. Amen? Too many times I think that people think that when they come into church and they give their heart to God, and this is what I feel like we see so much, is they think, okay, I'm on the right track. I've given my heart to God. Everything's, everything's all right. And then they think everything is going to be peachy keen from here. Amen? I want you to understand something. When you give your heart to God, when you turn your life around, the enemy is going to get mad. Amen? He is going to throw things in your face. He's going to try to bring doubt. He's going to try to bring fear. He's going to try to bring all these things into your life to make you feel like you're making the wrong decisions. I want you to understand something, that the problems that you think that you're facing after that, they were already there, amen? I want you to understand something, that the enemy is going to try to escalate your problems, but you want, I want you to understand something today, that the trials, no matter what you do, no matter where you go, whether you live in the world or whether you live for God, they're going to come, amen? Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. Rich people get rich. Poor people get poor. Amen. I'm just happy that I can pay my bills. Amen. Amen. Things are going to happen. Things are going to come. The enemy is going to get mad. and He's going to try to throw everything at you. I want you to know too many times I see people coming into church and they, they give their heart to God and they're looking for answers. They're looking for something to go right. And they come in, they give their heart to God, and everything begins to, to feel like it's on the right path. Amen. How many knows whenever you first accept Jesus in your life, it's just like this revitalizing, rejuvenating, just awesome feeling that, that just, it just feels like everything. You're on cloud nine, right? And then we leave and we go out, and when something goes wrong, what happens? We feel like, man, did I do something wrong? Is something going on? I want you to understand something. Trials are going to come. One of the things that I was thinking about with this that, I, that really kind of sticks to my mind is money. Amen. How many likes to talk about money? Amen. Listen, when churches begin to talk about money, everyone goes, oh, no, you're not supposed to talk about that. Listen, I want you to understand something the Bible teaches us that we should pay our tithes. Amen. But what happens is when you go out and you pay your tithes, what's going to happen is the enemy's going to throw something and be like, well, now you can't pay your bills. Where's that money going to come for your electric bill? Your car is going to break down. Things are going to happen. And this is just me being honest with you this morning. When you begin to trust God with your money, when you begin to trust God with your time and with resources, the enemy is going to make you begin to doubt what you are doing. I knew somebody one time that came in and they didn't, that we, we, uh, we talked with them about tithes and stuff like that. And they said, I just feel like God is telling me that I should tithe. And so they tithe that day. And uh, later on that week, I remember, this is actually just funny, their, their car broke down and uh, it wasn't working. And I, uh, dad was telling me the story and um, we were talking to them and stuff, and uh, they, they were like, man, well, if I didn't pay my tithe, I would have enough money to fix my car. And, uh, of course, that's where your first mind goes, right? Uh, I saw somebody was posting stuff about, like, Christmas stuff, and then they're like, every time a bill comes up and I think about all the Christmas gifts I bought that I shouldn't have, right? Um, but they, they said, if I didn't pay my tithes, I'd have enough money to pay uh, for my car. And then they were getting a ride from one of their buddies to go to work, and that day their buddy looked at him and says, hey, listen, I just feel like God is telling me that I should give you this. And they gave him a check for exactly the amount of money that they needed to pay for their car, Amen. And it's amazing how God can supply our every need when we are just trusting in him. Amen. But the trials are going to come. I want you to understand something. You may not give your tithe, but your car might still break down. Amen. I want you to understand something. You might still get home and your electric is turned off or your water is turned off. Things are going to come against us no matter where we're at. No matter what we do, we will face opposition in life. I remember whenever I first took over a store in uh, Laverne, Tennessee, I was a store manager there at a Valvoline for a while, and I remember I was about a week in, and, and I had just had like a, not, I, wasn't, I don't say a falling out, but just a rough week with God, amen? I wasn't, I wasn't doing everything I was supposed to be doing, I wasn't just feeling it like I was supposed to be feeling it, I wasn't doing all these things, and I remember the very first week, <laughs> this person that we had hired, and I, whatever, had put like five times the amount of oil in a car that they were supposed to that I wasn't watching. And I was like, I didn't realize it until I was in my office and I hear this clink, 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 clink. I'm like, oh, I didn't hear that before. And I look out and there's just smoke going everywhere. And I'm like, oh boy. And we took the drain plug out and there's all this stuff. And I thought for sure that this engine was toast. I was like, this is not good. And I remember I was like, God, 
why? I was like, I know that I've not been doing exactly what I'm supposed to do, but why would you bring this on me? And he reminded me right then and there. He says, these things are going to come whether you're serving me or whether you're not. He said, just you have to understand that there is confidence whenever you're living in me. Amen. And I remember I got on my knees and I was, I was just so, I was tore up from that because I understood something at that moment. God wasn't trying to punish me for not doing what I was supposed to be doing. He reminded me that I'm going to face things in life. I'm going to have problems in life. The difference is, is that whenever I have my trust and my hope in God, that I have a peace that passes all understandings. I can put my head down at night and say, God, I know things ain't going the way that I want them to go, but God, I know that you are in control. I can have confidence that I know that I know that I know that my family will be provided for. I can have assurance that knows that at the end of the day, no matter what I've done, whether I don't get the promotion at work, whether I'm just beat up or whether I'm persecuted or anything like that, that my God is in control. The world does not give me my joy, and the world cannot take my joy away. Amen. My hope, my trust, my confidence, and my joy is in God. Trials are going to come. Problems are going to come. The difference is, is that we can have hope in God that he will supply our every need. Amen. The second thing that came to my mind whenever I was thinking about trials was just because you're facing a trial in your life right now does not mean that you are doing something wrong. I want to repeat that for you because I think we have to understand this to a whole new meeting in this life, that just because you're going through something right now does not mean that you are doing something wrong. Too many times I think that, that we, we get into our relationship with God and we begin to get discouraged because we feel like, God, I'm serving you. God, I feel like I'm doing everything I should be doing right now, but it doesn't feel like everything is going the way it should be going. I want you to understand that I never understood quite to the meaning that I understand now as my uh, associate pastor role and in my youth pastor role, that you can feel like you're doing everything right and people still don't show up to church and you think, God, what am I doing wrong? God, am I, am I failing you? Am I missing the mark somewhere? And I want you to understand something that you can, I'm just, I want to put it as simple terms as I can. Sometimes you can do everything right and everything still feel like it is going wrong. But I lean on the word where it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, uh, and this is the English Standard Version. I apologize. I'll, I'll let you get the King James because that's what's going to be up there. So I'll read it off the screen. I don't want to. Ah, <laughs> chapter 30, or <laughs> verse 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, all all to the glory of God. Give no offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. And verse 33 says, Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. I want you to understand something that I lean on this passage a lot in my life. Because I want you to understand something that you can feel like everything is going wrong. You can feel like you're not doing anything right. And you feel like, God, I don't understand what is going on. But if you lean into your life and you can say, God, I am doing everything that I do to bring glory to you. God, I'm doing everything that I can do to bring uh, people to your saving grace. Then you can look at yourself and say, God, I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Too many times in life. We let the enemy jump in front of us, and he throws these obstacles in our way and begins to make us struggle in our, our, our mind and thinking of what is going on. And just like the song today, when it talks about Jesus and it talks about the name of Jesus, sometimes when things are not going right, we just need to get on our knees and just yell out the name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to understand if you don't know what else to pray, just begin to say the name of Jesus. And I can assure you one thing, that he will be right there with you. You don't have to pray your needs out loud because he already knows what's going on. If you don't have the words to say, just say Jesus. He's going to try to take everything down and tear you down. I want you to understand something that God should be our foundation. 
Things may go awry and it may feel like everything is going wrong. Just like in these trials when we talk about these knives and stuff like that. And they beat them in there. I want you to understand something. That when the enemy comes up and he tries to tell you that even though you're doing everything right, that everything is going wrong. If you just stick through the trial, if you just stick through there in the storm and you just call on the name of Jesus, he'll be right there with you. The great thing about these knives is sometimes in the show they break, sometimes they chip and they do all this stuff. I want you to understand something, that whenever God is on your side, it doesn't matter what the enemy throws our way. It doesn't matter what seems to be going wrong. We don't have to chip and we don't have to break because my God doesn't make things that lose and break, amen? When we are forged in the likeness of God, amen, we are forged into a place where no matter what comes or goes, we can still win. So when I think about this, I want to encourage you this morning. Because I know we talk about a lot of things. As, as pastors, it is frustrating sometimes when you feel like you're doing everything right. As leaders, if it, when you feel like you're doing everything right. As, as youth workers or as worship leaders, you feel like you're doing everything right. And nothing seems to be going in the direction that you feel like it should be going. I want to encourage you this morning to just keep doing what God has called you to do. Amen. Just keep following in the path that God has called you into because he's not going to leave us and he's not going to forsake us. Amen. As Sister Cindy gets ready for her Wednesday night Bible studies. Amen. We just keep doing what God has called us to do and God will bring what God needs to bring. Amen. I want to encourage you this morning that if everything that you do, whether you're a leader or not, brings glory to God, you're doing what God has called you to do. And you see, it's, it's, it's like this because the thing is, is when you are trying to glorify God, you're constantly asking God, what should I be doing next? God, where should I be going? God, what should I be doing? And whenever you're continuously asking God those questions, I can assure you one thing, God is going to answer. Because God doesn't want someone that says, God, I can do this, so I want you to use this. He wants people that say, God, I just want to serve you today. Ask yourself what you can do to serve the Lord. Bring glory to God, and he will make everything else come to pass. Amen? And the last thing that came to my mind when we talk about trials is that as crazy as it sounds, church, we should rejoice in the trials, and in the tribulations, and all the things that come against us, amen? First and foremost, when you give your heart to God, if the enemy comes at you and starts trying to throw things at you, I can assure you one thing, you're probably doing something right. Hmm. Because he wants you to fail. He wants everything to come against you, and he wants you to not feel like you are doing well, so he's going to throw as much as what he can do. But I love the book of James, mainly because it's my name, um... But it's a really good book, so I lucked out. Thanks, Mom and Dad. But James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. <laughs> oh, good. I did this and everything turned sideways. James chapter 1, verse 2. And it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that this, that this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and that it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for, the, for he that wavereth is like the wave of a sea, driven in the wind and tossed. I love in verse 2 when it starts out, it says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And this is why I say that we should rejoice whenever we go through things in life. Because I want you to understand the word tells us that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb. And what? The word of our testimony. I want you to understand something. How can you testify that God is good if everything's always just went good in your life? Look, I want you to understand, when I grew up, my parents didn't give me a car. They made me work, and I saved my money. All right? I worked a long time. Y'all could have helped out. Not playing. Uh, <laughs> I worked a long time, and I got my car, and I appreciated my little truck that I had, amen? I I see people all the time that that give their kids these brand new cars when they turn 16 and stuff like that, and I'm not talking about just giving them a car. Listen, that's neither here nor there, but they buy them these like 2020 cars, and they're like, hey, you deserve this car because you turned 16 and this, that, and it's like like cream of the crop, and what do they do? They go out, and they think, look how fast and shiny my car is. Let me run it into something, amen? (laughs) Amen. I'm telling you now, 
This happens all the time. I knew somebody in school, whenever, I can't remember what year it was, and I don't want to talk about it, uh, but they bought them this brand new Mustang, and what happened, it wasn't a week later, they was already running into something. And I was like, I could have taken nice care of that car. But they thought it was fast, they thought it was cool, they thought it was shiny, they wanted to show it off to their friends, but they hadn't worked a lick for it. It's the same way that we are, and I'm not saying that God puts us in these trials and things that go on just so that we see these things. But what I'm telling you is that God can bring glory in our trials. Why? Because we then have the opportunity to tell somebody, I've been where you are. I know what you're going through. And we have an opportunity to fill the kingdom of God with people who are going through things. Amen? Amen. We live in a world of people that are going through things, amen? Listen, we talked about the news earlier. You don't think people are going through stuff? Just watch the news for five minutes, amen? If you can stand it that long. We live in a world of people who are struggling and going through things. But I want you to understand, God does not produce failure. If we allow God to use us, if we allow God to put us where we need to be in our full potential, when the trial comes, I want you to understand that instead of us saying, oh God, why are we going through this? If we say, oh God, I thank you that I know that I know that I know that at the end of the day, you're going to bring me through what I am going through. If we would begin to use it as an opportunity to witness to others instead of feeling bad for ourselves or sorry for ourselves, and I apologize if I step on any toes with that, but it's not time for us to feel bad for ourselves, but rejoice that we serve a God who can and will supply our every need. Amen? We need to serve God as if everything doesn't matter except for glorifying Him. I want you to understand in James chapter 1, uh, when it says to count it all joy, in verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for he is tried. He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Church, when we endure the trials that come against us, amen, the word teaches us that, what? We will receive the crown of life, amen? And it says that we are tried, and that word tried means that, that we have been through stuff, and we know that we know that we know that our confidence and that our strength is in God. Just like David, when he stood before Goliath, before that, he stood before the king and he was trying to put all this armor on him and it wasn't fitting him because he was a small guy and he didn't know anything about how to use what he had there. But what was tried and true was his sling and his stone, amen? And he told the king, he said, I can't wear this stuff. It's not been tried. Just the same way. When we endure temptation, it says that we are tried and we will receive the crown of life. We should rejoice, not because we enjoy going through bad things. I want you to understand something very clearly. I do not enjoy bad things happening because, well, they're bad. <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> if I go out and I'm trying to shoot a deer and the bullet doesn't fire, that's bad. I'm not happy about said situation. But if I cock another one in and it's still standing there and the next one goes off, I'm happy, amen? When bad things happen, when your car breaks down, when you don't have money to pay your bills, whenever you lose your job or whenever you don't get the promotion that you've worked hard for, when, when things don't seem to be going the way they should be going, amen? We shouldn't just say, oh God, I'm just so happy about that. But what we should rejoice in is the fact that no matter what, that we know that God is in control. God's not going to leave us where we at. God didn't bring you here to leave you here. He will always be with us. He will never leave us and he will never forsake us. We have to learn to stand strong. You want to know what I love about knives? Is that they're inanimate objects. So no matter what I do, no matter where I go, if this knife isn't intended for what I thought it was intended for and I decide that I'm going to use it to pry open a screw or something out of something that I shouldn't be, this knife is going to go wherever I decide that I want to take it. This knife is going to go and do whatever I decide I want this knife to do. And then I thought about it and I was like, if we're talking about being forged in fire, when they make these blades and stuff, they're not intended to go bash open ice and all this other stuff, but they do it anyways. And then I thought, if we as Christians 
would be like this inanimate object and just say, God, wherever you tell me to go, whether it makes sense or whether it doesn't, God, I'm just going to go. Could you imagine what the church today would look like if Christians, instead of saying, God, take me here, say, God, I want you to take me to my full potential. God, I want you to take me where you want me to be. God, I just want you to do with me as you see fit. Could you imagine what the church of today would look like? I guarantee you a couple things. One, we wouldn't see churches that today are not proclaiming the word of God. Amen. I want you to understand something. If you stand behind the pulpit and you contradict the word of God, amen, there is a problem with what you are preaching and teaching. But if we said, God, I want you to tell me where to go, then I want you to understand something. We wouldn't see that. I want you to understand something that we would see churches not just full of members, but full of people that are on the path of trying to say, God, I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit today. Amen. We wouldn't see people preaching messages that are just happy go lucky. People would know the truth. I pray that I never preach a message or teach a word that goes against the word of God. And I, God, I'm sorry if I ever have, but I want you to understand something that today we need to stand on the word of God, whether it makes people happy or it doesn't. Amen. Just if we were just like these knives and says, God, send me where you want me to be. The churches today would look a whole lot different. Amen. So as we're getting to all of this stuff and in everything that we're talking about with these trials, I want you to understand something. God just kept placing it on my heart. God did not build you up. God did not bring you where you are just for you to fail. Amen. You might feel like you're failing. You might feel like you're going through some things. But God says just lean on him today. He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. And you might be saying, well, you know, I, maybe I've not been, been doing what I'm supposed to do. Maybe I've not been where I'm supposed to be. I want you to understand something. God is not worried about where you've been and what you did before. Amen. Just like these railroad spikes. He doesn't care where that's been. He can make you into something else. All you have to do is to lean onto him. Just like the prodigal son. Amen. One of my favorite stories, that, the parables that Jesus teaches in the Bible. It doesn't matter where the son went, the father was always there. God doesn't care where you've been or any of all that other stuff. He cares about you specifically. You are a child of the Most High God. When we are forged into his likeness, we are strong. We're ready to be put to use. No matter what the world brings our way, we can handle it. And I want you to understand something. This drives me nuts, and I'll, I'll, I'll get you all with this. I'll leave you all uh, kind of on this note. I am so tired of people living in this world of telling us that God won't ever give me more than I can handle. I want you to understand something. That is the most false statement ever because I want you to understand something. Without God, I can handle nothing. Amen. I can't handle anything the world throws at me. But God is never going to give you more than he can handle. I want you to understand that this morning. It's not about what you can do, but about what God can do in you. I am nothing without God in my life. And I've lived a world where I was nothing without God in my life. And I was angry, I was upset, I was sad, I was all of the above. And I want you to understand something. But God gives, puts a lot on my plate, it feels like sometimes. But I know that there's nothing that he cannot handle. It is not about what you can do, but about what God can do with you. And in this entire Forge and Fire series and all these things, I want you to understand something. And I feel like that's the point that God wants us to understand. And the reason he's placed this, this on our heart and in our lives today is there is nothing that you cannot do if you allow God to intervene in your life. You might be saying, well, I just, I, God, I feel like I'm supposed to do this, but I, I just can't do that. I want you to understand, Moses had a stutter, amen? Huh. Noah was old. Amen. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah, or uh, uh, not Abraham and Sarah. Yeah, Abraham and Sarah, boy, they were old. They weren't supposed to have kids. She was in her 90s, right? And lo and behold, they have a kid. I want you to understand something. You want to talk about not being able to carry more than you can handle, but what God can. Just like when Jesus was in the garden and he prayed to his father, the son of God prayed to God, said, if there be any other way, let it be. But God had a plan. 
There is nothing that God cannot handle. Even crying babies. <laughs> In this Forge and Fire series, I want you to understand that you will never, ever be able to understand the potential that God has in you. Every day, I am more and more surprised when God says, we're going to do this. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> Let God surprise you. Let God be in control of your life. The trials, they're going to come. Whether you got God in your life or whether you don't have God in your life, they're going to come. But I can assure you they are way better with God in your life than they are without. Amen. I'm going to have Mallory, she'll come to the piano. If y'all would stand with me this morning. When we were talking about these trials and when I think about it and when in the book of James it says to rejoice, I want you to understand something. When things come our way, we have to take the opportunity to be able to witness to somebody. In this entire series and stuff, we're talking about being used by God and all these things. I want you to understand something. When we talk about giving glory to God in all things, our only duty in life and our only call should be to make sure that everything we do is to glorify Him and lead people to the saving grace. Because when I get to heaven, I don't want to show up and be the only one there. That'd be a real lonely party, amen? I want to see all of y'all there. Not just all y'all, I'd like to see all of Ashland City there, amen? But I know that I live in a town full of people who are not saved. But our goal should be to reach out to those who are not. I, wanna, I don't want to see anybody go to hell. Hell was not made for you and I, amen? It was made for one purpose and one purpose only. And we choose where we go. The Bible teaches us that plainly. And I want you to understand something, that it breaks my heart to know that there's going to be people that I love and that I care about who are not going to be in heaven with me one day. And I pray for them, and I, and I hope, and I have faith that God is going to be able to reach them and touch them and talk to them and do something with them, but I don't want to see anybody go into that place. Amen? She's even sad about it, too. I want you to understand something this morning. When things come against us, when things go wrong, when things don't seem right, church, we need to lean on the Almighty God. Our confidence, our trust, and our faith needs to be in Him. Church, we need to be able to be used by God. And in everything in this, our simple use should be able to witness and be able to be showing to others that there is a God that cares about them more than life itself. That he was willing to die for you and I. I've never had a friend in my life who I thought was willing to die for me. That's a tough thing to do. But I've got a friend who was willing to die for me. Amen. Because I'm a friend of God. So this morning as we enter into a little bit more worship, these altars are open for each and every one of us this morning. But I want to give us the opportunity this morning. If you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior this morning, I want to give you that opportunity. You might be saying, I don't even know what that means. Well, if you come on up, we've got plenty of leaders and elders here and all that jazz that will be willing to walk you into that and explain to you what that means. But I want you to understand, when the trial comes, having God in your life just makes things so much better. You might be saying, well, I've, I've been there and I've done that and I just, I don't know. I want you to understand you can never pray too much, amen? God's always going to be listening. But also, these altars are open. If you've been going through things in your life, you think, God, I just don't know if I'm where I need to be. Pray to God. We'd be happy to join together with you. If you want to get alone on these altars, that's up to you. But when we leave here today, Leave with the understanding of knowing things may not feel like they're going right in life, but if we bring glory to God, amen, our hope, our peace, and our joy can